Claro. Bom, é, bom, primeiro, é, a live ela vai ser em inglês, mas ela vai para o YouTube depois é, com legenda em inglês. Bom, é, a live ABC ela foi idealizada como um espaço informal para a troca de conhecimento sobre a cinematografia. E assim como em todos os nossos eventos e publicações, reiteramos que não são tolerados comentários e posturas machistas, racistas, homofóbicas ou de qualquer natureza preconceituosa. All right. Um, so, uh, there's a limitation in Instagram of 60 minutes. So, uh, when we are close to 60 minutes, I'm going to have to end the stream and then yep. start another one and, and, and then you join back. All right? No, no problem. Great. So, uh, let's get this started. So, mm -hmm. um, my first question is going to be... Um, How do you think uh, your background, your culture, and the way your career started um, have shaped you as the director of photography that you are today? Um, that's a good question. Well, I mean, you know, every, every, every culture has a way of seeing, right? Every culture has a vision of themselves, whether it be Brazilian, Mexican, African cultures, Uh, Brazilian cultures, everybody has a, a rendition of themselves, whether it be through sculpture, painting, early sculpture, early cave etchings, all the, we all have a, a specific vision of how we see ourselves in the story of our people, you know, in the story of our culture. And the, and the, <clears throat> the powerful thing about, uh, you know, all of these, the powerful thing about art is that they're all symbols and, and, and uh, culture is about us agreeing upon a certain set of symbols that essentially <clears throat> tell our story. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, not just my experience, but my ancestors experience, you know, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> also defines the way that I, uh, I see light, you know, it, my, my, uh, my, um, My, my 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 experience as a as a my experience as a black person in the Americas um, define, has been defined by places where I've been allowed to go or places where my ancestors have been allowed to go and things that we have been allowed to do, which has kept us away from certain kinds of resources. And mm -hmm. so, as as you know, as a cinematographer, sometimes those restraints uh, create culture, right? They create a certain way of seeing. So whether it be the lack of light or the lack of architectural integrity that allows us to have certain kinds of light in our houses or certain kinds of light in the places where we pray and a certain kind of light in the places where we worship or um, the, the certain kind of light in the places where we congregate and gather. Um, it's all defined by our experience and mm -hmm. specifically, <clears throat> specifically my experience and my ancestors experience, my people's experience in the Americas has been a very, um, complicated layered but it's been defined you know it's been defined mm -hmm. in a very particular way and so my experience with light is very different from my my children's experience with light mm -hmm. it's going to um <clears throat> every generation fulfills a, a new responsibility and that new responsibility brings certain kinds of resources and so and 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 how we engage with these resources and how we engage with these things is all determined by light if there's no light then there's no seeing, there's no, there's mm -hmm. no understanding, right? There's no enlightenment. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, you know, my, 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 um, my way of seeing starts in a little, in a, a little small town in the state of Kentucky called mm -hmm. Louisville, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it also exists in Chicago, Illinois, it exists in Washington, DC and all these places where I've lived or where places, spaces where, places where I've occupied spaces have a, um, they all have a, a specific kind of light story, you know, um, atmospheric sure. light, um, you know, how we engage with the night, how we engage with the day. It's yes. all determined, it's all determined by who you are and where you want to be and the people you want to be close to. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the short, the short, the short long of it, you know, um, uh -huh. Yeah, I think I think uh you know, I think without 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 light without culture there's no there's not even an understanding of light, you know. Mm -hmm. Um you have to have an you have to have a culture allows us to have a understanding of um astrology. It allows us to have an understanding of interstellar our interstellar reality. It allows us to have an understanding of our spiritual reality. 
and uh you know mm -hmm. it, it specifically gives us a story about all of these elements that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis you know whether it be the rain the wind the light the shadow you know it all is that it all has to filter through culture before we can articulate how it makes us feel or how it how it allows us to see sure sure uh, and and do you think this is inherent in you, or do, do, did you go after the uh, this you know knowledge about who you are, and or is it natural? Mm, I think it's natural in all of us, um, mm -hmm. but not everybody has the language mm -hmm. or the um, the the language, the ability, or the desire to have a, a, the same kind of relationship with it that we as cinematographers do. You mm -hmm. know. Um, this is this is this is the art form that we use to communicate to our to each other to the world and so um and and without light we don't have we don't have without light we have no skill right without light we don't have the yeah. tool to communicate um but i think so <clears throat> you know in that sense of just on the human level yeah it's inherent it's like mm -hmm. you know this is this is who we are you know this is i think this is more natural to us than being a politician or being a, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, I feel like building empires is not natural for humanity, but sharing art and making art is very instinctual for us. You know, this, this sure. is first, you know, um, Definitely. but, but as a, but as a, as an individual in the human story, um, no, nah, it wasn't, in, it was, it wasn't inherent. <laughs> it's something I had to, uh, <laughs> develop a relationship with, you know, it's something that I had to uh, work hard at, you know, because it did not mm -hmm. come instinctual to me. It was not inherent. It wasn't an inherent thing to me. Um, I think somewhere deep down inside, I appreciated aesthetics. I appreciated form. I appreciated um, style. I appreciated fashion. I appreciated these things. I appreciated art, but um, cinema as a, uh, Cinema felt like a very well, number one. I didn't have any relationship with it. Like I didn't know what it was until I turned eighteen. Like I went to the movies, like all of us, and went, and went to see movies and watch movies. But I didn't understand how movies were made. I didn't. I didn't know there was a cinematographer. I didn't know there was a, a production designer. I didn't know there was a costume designer. Those are all things that I had to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And once I learned them, I had to figure out where my place was within it. You know. And um, so yeah, so. It's a good, good. It's a really, it's a really good question in the sense that I also know that I'm quite aware that many of my colleagues is very natural for them. <laughs> uh -huh. It comes naturally to them, you know. Uh, you know, they were born. I feel like some of us were born, born to do this. You know, this is what we were born into. We were born into the light. We were mm -hmm. born with the gift, the gift of seeing. You know, the gift mm -hmm. of seeing um, things in a cinematic way. I, I don't feel like I've was born with that you know this is something that i've had to i've struggled with i still struggle with um and i made a choice to struggle with it because i, I felt like it was important versus you know some of my friends you know like a uh, autumn derod or a natasha brayer or a darius kanji or uh, you know you know you know an ed lackman or a, or a mark ping ping bing or a, a cesar shalone like these are folks that i just feel like are born they're born to move the camera they're born to <laughs> to work with light, you know what I mean? This is every day for me is a, you know, every day I wake up <clears throat> and I like, I pull my camera out. You see, it's like, right, I'm in my bedroom, by the way, but every morning uh -huh. I wake up and I have, I have my camera here in the corner and then, you know, I just get up, I'll show you. I get up and I, uh, let's see if I can show you something. Like this morning, I was just uh, taking pictures up. Oh, you know, just taking pictures out my window. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Taking pictures of my kids and uh, see if I can find something. Else. You know, pictures of my kids. Oh, that's beautiful. But I have to, you know, I have to do this. I have to do that every day. You know what I mean? Beautiful. Like I have to, I have to make it. Because if I don't, then I'm not the type of person that can just not shoot. And think uh -huh. that I'm gonna gain some gain something. I have to practice every day to gain the skill. I'm not Michael Jordan. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the Michael Jordan of cinematography. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. I have to really 
or, or the Dennis Rodman or the Allen Iverson. Like, I really have to, I got to mm-hmm. work hard. You know what I mean? I got to work hard. So. Yeah, it's like a, a creativity is like a muscle that you, you, you need to keep improving. And, and in the long term, you kind of see the improvements that you make creatively. So it, it's really important right. to stay active. Right? Uh, and right. not only uh, in, in photography and, and, and cinema, do you think music or dancing or architecture uh, can have an influence on, on you as an artist, too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, architecture for me is, is like my second love, you know, and mm. uh, and I, I got that from my father. My father was not an architect, but he loved architecture. So mm-hmm. early on, my father made me, um, you know, very much aware of structure, you know, building mm-hmm. form and how it informs uh how they shape light you know um i've i've again that wasn't something that came natural to me it wasn't i have a natural relationship because for me architecture was just the house i grew up in or the school i went to or you know it was very those are very simple sort of civil things mm-hmm. but architecture as an art form that came to me later <clears throat> and uh you know uh Cinematography actually helped me appreciate architecture, but more than anything, it helped me appreciate the way architecture, its relationship to light. And uh, so now that I'm using light as a, as a way to communicate, you know, I can't, I can't engage with architecture the same way, you know what I mean? Architecture mm-hmm. means so much to me, to my process. Um, and, uh, and I want it to be important to my children. Like I want them to exist and live in a space that is filled with light or, Light is defined. Light has a purpose. Light has a story. It's not just a window, but there's a window there for a reason, right? And that's the same thing we, with lighting, right? We put light or we put the camera in a certain places for a reason. And so, mm-hmm. um, so our architecture is majorly in, inspiring. And it's something that I'm like, uh, it's something I'm learning. I want, I'm trying to see if I have a book in my room here. Uh, no, no architecture books. But maybe in the second <laughs> hour, I'll, I'll come back. I come uh-huh. back, but I'll show you. I'll show you something else. Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this Instagram. This is you can do this on Instagram, right? <laughs> sure. You know, or like right by my bedside, right, right now. You know, this is this is a, this is from his old. This is from a very old show, but right now, you know, I got I got Steve McQueen by my bedside. You know, because I'm thinking about thinking about you know textiles. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So it's not just it's not just. Uh, it's not just light. It's not just architecture. It's also the story behind. Beautiful. Every, Amazing. He had a story behind. He had a story behind everything he made. You know what I mean? And so. Mm-hmm. And it just happens to be that all these images are top lit. So it's telling me a lot about how you top light textiles and you know awesome. these are just things I got sitting around. Um, and then music. Music. It's when I wake up in the morning and. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't go off in my house until we all go to bed. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a constant. <laughs> um, my kid, it's a constant. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I don't have any music here, but you know, you get your iPad on and early in the morning. You put your, you know, we got speakers all around the house, and we're always playing music. You know, it's, um, right. but specific, but specifically, I'm, um, you know, I I would love for my film my filmmaking experiences to be more more musical. I would love for them to be more mirror. Uh, musical collaborations more you know I would love for them to be um, <clears throat> more free you know I think mm-hmm. film film is a very new art form right 150 mm-hmm. years old maybe a le- less yeah and so it uh it doesn't have the discipline it doesn't have the maturity as jazz or hip-hop or mm-hmm. um, I mean even jazz is younger than film but it has more maturity because it's a musical art form you know what I mean exactly. so it's ancient right if it comes from my voice and our voice comes from music. So without music, we don't, we would not even have the ability to communicate. Right. So, but without mm-hmm. film, we could still, we could still engage with one another. Um, so there's a lot of things about musical, the musical experience or the making of music that I really admire the sense of euphoria that musicians experience when they're, mm-hmm. um, when they're making music together, you know, um, uh, the sense that the sense of being able to free and be able to freestyle in the moment and being able to hear and see the results in real time. So you improvise something as a jazz musician with an audience on an album, and you, you're able to look at the audience directly and see them experience something very specifically from your improvisation. These are things that we, we, um, 
this is something I'm able to experience on a film set. I think we have our own version of that, and I'm still trying to explore what it is. What it is. Um, but yesterday I was in conversation with Rodrigo Prieto, and he, he did say something that was really interesting, which is that cinematography is an abstract art form. So we are, we are, we are engaging with um, somebody's deconstructed reality. We have to filter. We have to take somebody's vision. It has to go out into the world. It has to filter through the world. It has to then become a light. It, 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 it as an intellectual process has to become a physical thing. But even when it becomes physical, it still becomes abstract because all of our, he said it so eloquently, and I'm trying to paraphrase it, but everything <laughs> we have, everything, all the energy that it took to get to the light is then now filtered into the light. So all of the people that had ideas now has to be filtered, filtered through the, through the, through the light. I think there's something musical about that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not as energetic. It's not, it doesn't have as, the same kind of inertia as making something with, your friends on stage for 12 minutes or, and then you put your instrument down, you walk away. Um, I wish it was more like that. I think, I think, I think we, and I think this time is interesting because I think that's what it's going to lead us back to making films a much more freer way, you know, mm -hmm. less, less, less elements, less people. I think that's going to render a, a more ingenuine, um, euphoric filmmaking experience, you know, where we can change things, in real yeah. time or we can adjust things in real time, you know, based on the feeling or an idea and not feel like we're buckled down by schedules or agendas. That's, that's a different, that's a different, that's a, that's, that's, it's fine. It's a fine way of working, but it's a different, it's just a different, um, it's not as musical, you know, it's yeah. more bureaucratic, it's more bureaucratic. It's yes, more political, yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, maybe photography since, um, it's kind of like an improvisation because you're making, something in, in a microsecond, not like a song, but it's, it's an improvisation that you make in, in a microsecond. So it probably has a, a, a better relation with, uh, you know, music and stuff. And film is, is something so, that like, extends so much that maybe, yeah. you know. It's more sculptural, you know. It's more yes, sculptural. exactly. It's more, it's exactly. more sculptural. It's, it, it um, you know, with cinematographers, we're there in the moment getting the moment and that's everything we that's everything about that's that's everything that we do you know mm -hmm. but that we got to remember that you gotta have if every good cinematographer is a, probably a good editor as well mm -hmm. because every good editor i hate to use the i don't want to use the word cut but splices chops it chops <laughs> it up and, and then takes a step away you know you know takes a step away and then comes back you know so the ability to watch something Mm -hmm. take a few days off and come back and engage with it that that's that's very sculptural you know that's mm -hmm. very painterly you know mm -hmm. um we should i think what we need to do is develop a culture where we encourage that for ourselves on sets where we're able to as cinematographers make an adjustment step away look at it think about it see how it works in your spirit and your soul and go back sure. and engage with it again unfortunately time is, doesn't allow us to do that but if you can have experiences in your development where you can engage with storytelling that way, I think you'll be a better cinematographer for it, for sure. Nice. Yes. Great. Okay, so <laughs> uh, moving to one of your films, uh, in Mother of George, um, yeah. I see that there are plenty of uh, shots that you use the telephoto lens to that yes. kind of detach the, the characters from the world around them. So. So could you share a bit of your pro of your creative process and not only regarding lenses but also on establishing these types of narrative tools to to tell a story right um, yeah I mean you know well mother of george had two ha has uh two two perspectives one is um it's about the camera being in the story, being inside the story, being an active participant in the story. And then there's a camera that is, is, uh, it's a camera subjective when it's in the story. It's, if you see the film, it's, it's much wider, it's more intimate, it's closer, right? Even mm -hmm. on longer lenses. But mm -hmm. then there's a, the other perspective, which is very objective, where the camera is looking from across the street or across the room or through layers of, curtains mm -hmm. and window broken fragmented things and so what we were essentially trying to do is em embody two things that we thought were important 
in telling the story of an immigrant family. I mean, in, in an immigrant family that's trying to wrestle with tradition, but also um, live in the now, you know, um, mm -hmm. but still respect tradition. So question tradition, respect tradition as a contemporary modern human being, specifically an African. Mm -hmm. specifically a Nigerian living in specifically in New York. So, <laughs> you know, um, but it's all about how people see how we see one another. So, you know, the long lens of sort of objectified view is about, you know, how, how, how we see certain people in our society, you know, uh, we tend to view them from across the street and still try to tell their story. You know, mm -hmm. we have to extrapolate by the way they move or what they wear, or the way they engage with their children, or the way they eat or the way they drink, we have to assume we know the story, right? And that's mm -hmm. a very, that's a very, that's a very different perspective than the camera being or us being in the conversation, either speaking the language or trying to understand the language by respecting the culture and respecting the language. Mm -hmm. That's a different, that's a different camera placement. That's, that's probably, you know, if you took the camera and you took the subject, you know, and you and you and you look at it the way I'm looking at it on the screen, or the way I'm looking mm -hmm. at you. I try look. I try to put my hands above your face. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> look at look at you. Is it? Uh, you know, I always do that test where it's if I'm on a 21 millimeter lens and the face is here, if the if the lens is back here, mm -hmm. you can't see if the lens is way back over way over here, way over here. Then that's probably not the right story, right? Uh -huh. and then I try to start closing that in. The human being stays the same. I start to move my camera and camera and camera, in. and depending on what the story is, is either the story is either here, or the story's here. Mm -hmm. It's not all this in between. All this in between doesn't. It's not where the story is. The story is, is here, you know, or the story is, the lens all the way across the room, you know, or, or you know behind, you know, looking at looking at us. So, on a longer lens, these are these are the, this is for me about perspective, and this is something that every every film needs to fulfill is about what especially cinematographers like what is our way of seeing what is the story we're telling by where we are placing the camera and more importantly what is the story we're telling by the optics that we use right mm -hmm. we have we have man we have so many tools in our paint box right we have so many tools we have man we have we have uh <laughs> we have gels we have bed sheets we have yeah. brown paper bags we have filters we have lenses we have emulsion we have LUTs we have film stocks we have you know we have all types of things we yeah. have fake we have fake film grain we have all types of things that we can use <laughs> to to tell the story and so um you know with mother george it was really one of the strong one of the strong uh storytelling tools were, was optics right really mm -hmm. if, if it was long lens and it was looking in it had to look through a layer of something and that just made that just made when the camera was in the room that much more felt you know what i mean it made it more the, it made the jump jump past the layer of diffuse the layer of glass or the layer of beads or the layer of texture that made it that much stronger I, we thought you know we thought that was what would uh uh come across and so that mm -hmm. was what, what the idea the idea was so uh, also, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, you you seem to have a very uh, lenses seems to have a, a huge importance for you in, as a narrative tool. Is that what led you to collaborate with the creation of Tribe Seven Lenses? Can you tell it a little bit about about that? Yeah, I mean, you know. Let me let me start off by saying that not in a million years that I think uh, I would be making lenses like. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's more it's, it's more mysterious than uh, being a filmmaker, right? Um, uh -huh. And this wasn't or being a cinematographer. I mean, this wasn't something that I that I asked for, or it was something I was pursuing, or it was something that I thought, uh, you know, would ever happen. So it really, it really, it happened the way it was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wasn't I wasn't expecting it, and um, you know. The, you know, the, st the story is at the time I was working on solo and I had the wonder wonderful opportunity to work with all my friends at Airy Rental and um, London. And uh, that in that includes, you know, many char cast of characters who I really love, who are all being very helpful with me trying to figure out how I wanted to lens the film. And one of the individuals that I was working with was a, a lovely person who's now become my business partner, Neil Fathom, who was one of the uh, lens specialists at mm -hmm. Airy um, 
Terry Rental in London. And so, you know, after many, many months of trying to find the look of the film, some things happened in the process of lenses and getting rid of stuff and <clears throat> trying out other lenses. And, and uh, 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 you know, I, I had I had a set. Actually, I just saw somebody here. This is, all, this is all new for me. So I'm looking at all these hearts here, which is really <laughs> strange and very uh -huh. psychedelic. And then I see somebody here <laughs> saying, uh, is that Tejido? T-E-I-J-I-D-O. This person says, what about falcon lenses? So, yeah, so, yeah, I, I had these falcons, right, which were given to me by another friend, Kay, Kayvon Halami, who's at uh, Camtech in, in uh, California. He has a wonderful camera rental house, Camtech. And uh, he's, he's, he's definitely the, the, the lens genius of, of one of the many lens geniuses. Not many. There are only a few, but he's one of the lens geniuses of our industry. And uh, he called me up one day and said, hey, I have these lenses that I thought were going to go on this other film, but they're not going. And they're, they're this old Canon glass, and you should take a look at them if you're going to be shooting a Lexus 65. Excuse me. And um, I looked at them, and it, I saw the 85 and the 55, and I was like, these, this is the best glass I've seen in a very, very long time. So I grabbed those up. But in the meantime, in the background area was had the DNA glass, and I was working with the DNAs, and I was trying to detune those, those lenses to, be, to really give them a strong, strong vibe, a strong look. A strong energy and um mm -hmm. in the process of trying to figure out what the look at that was that that where, where that look was going to exist in the lenses and on the screen uh neil 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 was taking note he was in the background watching okay this adjustment here you know um you know this pupil flare here or this these non-anatized elements inside the lens that create this certain level of halation here and here and you mm -hmm. know uh, let's not let's not get rid of the you know the chromatic aberrations. Let's keep those. You know all the things that I was like picking apart, and he was in the background listening and say, okay, he likes that. He likes that. That's interesting. I haven't seen you know da 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 da. And so he took note, and then basically one day he came to me and said, hey, listen, I'm um, I want to stretch out. I want to grow. I want to grow as a filmmaker. I want to grow as a as a as a as a physicist. I want to grow as an artist. And uh, I know you love music like I love music. I know you love film like I love film. And I know you love lenses like I love lenses. And I'm thinking about starting this lens company. And from there, it was, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, he had already listened. This, this, Neil had already done much of the leg, leg work. Um, but he needed a, you know, he needed a partner and, and uh, I agreed to it. And, and from there, we started to craft, you know, with this whole, with this whole, uh, um, company was going to look like you know and mm -hmm. why we were why we were even interested in making lenses and part of it was you know we're now you know we're, we're now working in a in a, a format formerly known in film as vista vision which we're hoping to uh we're hoping will find its its identity again and find itself on film sets but you know all of our full frame cameras that we're using whether it be the venice or whether it be the lf or what have you are they're all uh you know they're all working within the same the same uh, uh, roster as 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 Vista Vision, and so, um, but there was no glass. You know, all that legacy glass is probably gone, thrown away, sitting on some shelf, getting moldy and old. And everybody's mm -hmm. now concocting new lenses to feed the need to um, supply large format imagery. And so we um, we knew that there were going to be the big the big cats at the top, your Zeisses, your Cooks, your you know, your Panavisions, who you can't buy lenses from, but, you know, your Zeiss, your Cook, your Leicas, those, all these folks in the world were going to be making lenses, and those lenses were going to have, they need to retain the Leica look. They got to retain the Cook look. They have to retain what's, uh, what people love about Zeiss, right? Um, mm -hmm. And none of the, and for us, and for us, we, we wanted to have a different, a different conversation with cinematographers. We wanted to provide them with something that had much, a lot more character, and we wanted to provide them with the opportunity to craft their own wavelength of characteristics and how they tune their set and how they tune mm -hmm. either tuning in each individual lens or actually how they tune the full spectrum of the seven lenses in their set. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and try to create them at a price point that made it affordable for, you know, cats like you and I, who don't, I don't have, a, I don't, I don't, who don't have a ton of money to spend on gear or people like us that may not buy gear. Like I don't have any gear. I don't have, I don't have anything. I have my camera. I just showed you, you know, uh -huh. so if I'm, so if I'm going to buy lenses, it, it would make it need be accessible to uh, filmmakers that, that mainly, um, you know, who shoot, you know, low budget to medium budget films and they can have access to that. But also, you know, we want to sh shoot for the stars too. We want to make sure we can get in the hands of 
to bigger cinematographers who we knew would be we would take them onto bigger projects because we do feel like they they're very expressive they have a lot to say um and they're based on some really old some really old but refreshing and uh genuinely uh you know innovative ideas that we were visiting in the 30s the 50s and the 60s that we kind of moved away from so we kind of wanted to revisit some of those some of those techniques some of those same ideas and optics and so um yeah so that's how we that's how we got started. Nice. That's how that's how we're chugging along. Every day is a new adventure. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, uh, you bring the, you know, the the artistic feedback to to him, and, and he has the, the mathematical part. And, and that's it. That's, that's, that's the, it. Uh, best of both worlds. Right? <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it. So, um, it. all right. So, also one of the things that I I love about your work is uh, like the use of color. Like uh, Pariah, Mother of George, uh, even most violent, uh, the most violent year, um, mm. color seems to play a huge part in their narrative. So, how's your collaboration uh, with the art director and your colorist, and how do you deal with color in your films? Yeah. Um, well, you know. I should say this. You can never, you can't really, you know, colors everywhere. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. relative, you know? And so, it's not that you never, um, it's not that I, or, you know, it's not, I don't feel like artists really, I mean, you can't run from color. It's everywhere. So you have to engage with it. It just depends yeah. on what colors, what colors are you engaging with when you, based on the story that you're telling? You know, mm -hmm. every story has a, every story has a, a palette. Every story has a, particular color that you're trying to take away or or advance and so um you know i i i try to do my homework when i'm reading the script i try to i try to figure out where that is i try to see those colors and you know sometimes it's not descriptive it's not the language of the script sometimes it's just the feeling it's uh it's it's about how the, how the spirit touches you and tells you what colors need to be in the film and so mm -hmm. you know um every film has its uh, own particular palette based on the story they're trying to tell. And what I do is I try to develop lookbooks that communicate, can possibly communicate to the art director, production designer, costume designer about how I see color, right? And so how 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 will a more subdued, low contrast, desaturated palette like Arrival um, influence the, let's say, the hazmat uniforms that they, those orange costumes that they wore, or hazmat mm -hmm. uniforms they wore into the ship, like, you know, if you have such a low contrast desaturated palette, are you are you bringing too much attention to the suits and what does that have to look like and should they be as orange as what they were and can we is that something we should fix later when we're doing the DI like all those questions 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 arise and you have to you know ultimately have to lay it all out on the table as the image maker as the cinematographer as the art director production designer as the costume designer you have to look at everybody's material has to be laid out you know whether it be on the table a wall on a computer what have you and you have to see the fine relationships between certain textures certain colors and if if you have the visual story, if you have the color story there, if you have the visual story, the textual story, you can see it when you grid it all out. And people have laid out what they, and and um, mm -hmm. what they what they've done. Like you know, I showed you that Alexander McQueen. You know, like Renee April, who is Denise's uh, uh, costume designer, who I'd worked with before on another film. Um, you know, I t you know, you take samples, you take drawings that she's she's made, and you look at what she's thinking about in terms of color. You see swatches of material, and you see that. And, and those aren't just, I never take those things and just look at them and say, uh, okay, that's just the material and let it be. I look at it and I really try to study it and see how, um, you know, how it could be, how can I add to that, you know? Not how can I can dismiss it and try to find a way to get my own agenda in there, but how can I, how can I contribute to the work of, a, of Renee, who she's such a master of what she does, how can I make a contribution to, to the, to the, to the to the the structure that she's building, and the story that she's building in the costume, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, for me, so for me, the, the color story and those things start to come out as we um, as we develop the look of the film, and the look of the film isn't always just. It's not about it's not it's not it, the 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 uh, the weight of that responsibility doesn't just sit on me as the cinematographer. Mm -hmm. 
when we say visuals, when we say the visuals of a film or we say the visual language of the film, it's not, that's not, that's not, a, that's not the bag that only the cinematography carries. That's, mm -hmm. that's carried by every department that puts a texture or um, a piece of material or um, something made by hand, something crafted. Anybody that puts something crafted and conceptualized from the human consciousness into physical form or the human consciousness into spiritual form, any. Any of, the, any of that that goes in front of the camera, that, that person is, contrib is a contributor to the visual language of the film. True. And um, so, yeah, color, color is, and color's taught, color's hard, right? Because everybody has their own idea about what, how color should appear in the film. And so mm -hmm. you have to find, essentially you have to find the harmony, right? You have to figure out all the tension of struggling with that green or struggling with that orange or struggling with that blue or, you know, you have to find the harmony, and and I think that's when you start to that's when you start to see if you laid it out a lot on the page, you start to see the, the the common links, the bridges, and so mm -hmm. that and that and color and color seems to be one of the most difficult things to really, because you don't you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, you don't want color color can be distracting, right? That was the beautiful yeah. thing about black and white cinematography. Black and white cinematography is very binary, so you you're not focused mm -hmm. on the color of the trees or the color of the grass or the blue sky. You're focused on the texture and the story, right? The the atmosphere of the space and the story of these humans who are who are neutral or not neutral, who are in complete shadow or in complete highlight or, ne or neutral. When mm -hmm. color is about the sweater they're wearing, the pants that they're wearing, the color of their hair, the tree, the da da da. It's a lot of harder stories to tell, so you have to be very careful and very conscious of. It. You have to make very specific choices. Um, in terms of like colors, you know, I worked with one cat, uh, Joe Gollard for, uh, since Pariah, you know, and, um, I, you know, <laughs> and honestly, it's hard for me to imagine ever working with anybody else. And I tend not mm -hmm. to, um, and I tend to make, um, him the first person that I hire on every show, um, because I want to make sure that our collaboration is sustained and uh, I'm able to, because I, I really do depend on him a lot, uh, not just the color of the film to make the film look like something, but he starts day, with, day one with me as I start to, as I start to develop LUTs, <clears throat> film emulation mm -hmm. LUTs. He's there with me, giving me the science. And, and you know, it's not just Joe, but it's also uh, a wonderful color scientist, color scientist named Matt Tomlinson, who's also uh, mm -hmm. a person who I work with. And then uh, we also have our, um, I work with two colorists, uh, work, work with Roman and Joe, and both Roman and Joe work at the same facility, but we work together as a three. You know, mm -hmm. Roman, Roman, <clears throat> Roman does my dailies, but usually my dailies, and the way I'm working now is that my, by the time I get to the DI, my dailies are basically the DI. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I'm grading my dailies like I'm grading the DI, and I'm building nice. a lot, a lot that makes it very easy for Roman to make very few adjustments to, to get the image, get, to get the image very close to what I want it to be on the screen. Mm -hmm. And when and Joe usually does all the heavy lifting of the nuance, the things that even I don't see, even things that I can't communicate, right? Because I'm too nah. close to the image. He's the person that I pass it off to who see who takes it to the next level. And I don't. He doesn't need my approval. He doesn't need to show it to me. He doesn't need to ask me if it's right or wrong. All he needs to do is just do it. And 99.99% of the time is way better than I ever imagined it. <laughs> and, I have, and I have no feedback. <laughs> so that's kind of how the cycle goes I, you know, I make the uh -huh. LUT with Matt I make the LUT with Matt, Joe, and Roman we all have our feedback with the director that LUT then goes to set with, with my DIT who's part of that whole cycle and I usually use one or two folks generally mm -hmm. Matt Love who is my favorite, who's the person that I work with and love the most um, and uh, and uh, I um he sets it up so it's all nice and tight and it's all the flow is there and it's all in communication with everybody. We're all, every monitor on set is calibrated and we're actually seeing the image, the proper inputs, outputs, so, every image, so everything that we pipe through the light is representative of what it should look like in the daily. So by the time it gets to the dailies with Roman, Roman's doing small things like focusing on a primary color or doing something very mm -hmm. small like mm, could have timed this down a little bit i usually don't even go to secondaries i usually stay away from windows or anything like that we actually try to do that by cutting the light and making sure i put the light in the right place and that's a lot easier when you work with secret source lights mm -hmm. then uh then throughout the whole editorial process roman is tweaking and joe's tweaking so then we're creating stills we do stills we do a, a layout of stills that are, that are then graded throughout the process of editing so that the director can see the film linear not motion but in still so you can see the, again that color story that lookbook mm -hmm. and then uh by the time you know i guess the get to the di with joe and joe is you know 
the last few films, including Solo, like I didn't, I spent very, I spent very few days in the DI. <laughs> if, wow. if, I had, if, it, if it was a, if it was a, well, you know, Joe did. Joe spent a lot of days in the room working, but I did. I don't, I don't, uh-huh. I don't love, I don't love DIs. I don't love, <laughs> dark, I don't love being in uh-huh. a dark room for weeks without my family trying to undo or redo or trying to make something better. Like that's not, that's not. My talents aren't there, you know what I mean? Somebody else has to do it, which means that uh, I have to work with somebody who is a better visual storyteller than myself, and Joe is mm-hmm. that, you know, and I'm mm-hmm. happy to. Honestly, if if it wasn't required for me to approve something, <laughs> once, 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 once I'm off the movie, I'm just give it to Joe, and then I uh-huh. know, I'll see it if I ever see it at the movie theater or if I don't, if I do or I don't, I'm happy that if Joe put his hands on it, I know it's going to be uh-huh. better, you know, and he's, and he's, and he's able to work with directors. Well, I don't have to be in the room with them. I could show up every now and then and see what they're doing and go about my business. And that's how our process works. You know, that's great to, to trust someone so much. You have so much chemistry with, with another professional that you trust them so much that you, 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 you could leave your, them creative creatively free so license yeah no he's he's i i do not i don't have to say much <laughs> <laughs> I, but i do i do have to say a lot like the new film that i'm working on you know it's very different for us it's very different uh-huh. film visually for us and uh I'm, we're, we're not shooting now we're hopefully we'll go back to inshallah we'll go back to make the film but uh you know i, I had to stay thoroughly at the top like this is not going to be that film We are going mm-hmm. to do something we have not done since Pariah, and so you need we need to prepare mm-hmm. ourselves. Nice. And after I had that conversation with them, it's pretty much mm-hmm. know, give give them a look book, show them the images, call them a few times, you know, hang out, have fun together, hang out and talk about family and friends. But it usually is no more about the film, not much more about you know a frame or a scene. He usually mm-hmm. just does it, you know. And anybody that works with Joe Galler uh, will tell you that, you know, you saw you know more. More Acad- more more films nominated for Academy Awards this year were colored by Joe Galler. That's Lighthouse, uh, you know. Nice. Uh, or if not Joe Harbor, who's the company that he works for. So they did a lot of films last year, you know, Tarantino, mm-hmm. and the list goes on and on. So. Nice. Yeah. You mentioned that you to make a you you create a lookbook for for each film. So. Uh, how exactly do you organize it? Where, where what are your resources and and to mm. show people? Yeah, that's good. Uh, um, well, I used to do a lot of the aggregating on my own, so I spend days, weeks on the internet trying to pull images. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'll, I'm not doing that anymore. In fact, I'm, I work with a I work with a great director and person that pulls images named uh, Matt Sterling. I started working with him on this new film that I'm working on, and so. I allow somebody else to pull the images for them and I prompt them with, uh, with ideas, you know, you know, uh, betrayal, loneliness, da, 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 all these words, all these ideas that, nice. uh, <clears throat> come to mind. And then he goes into the well of search engines that I have no access to. I just wouldn't even be able to understand if I was in there. He goes in, mm-hmm. he starts to collect. And then, you know, I, you know, for my, for my library of like, books that I have at home that I, that I no longer want to open up and put on a scanner. Like I'm not doing that <laughs> anymore. So I want to preserve, I want to preserve uh-huh. them as books that my kids can look at and people can appreciate. Maybe one day we'll have a library here in Baltimore where cinematographers can come and actually put their hands on them. They sh- we should right. preserve them so that uh-huh. they stay fresh and crisp. So, you know, I'll say, you well, look, go, go look at Todd Hito, go look at Roy De Caraba, go look at all these other folks that I like for the film. And then go look at Martina Hoover and Ivan Al, go look at, Carrie Mae Weems, go look at Carrie Marshall, go look at Leslie Hewitt, go look at Titus Kafar, go look at all these people that I really think are going to in, inform the film visually, and then just send me images. And then, you know, two days later, I get a Dropbox of more images than I can imagine. And usually mm-hmm. my assistant, my assistant is a wonderful cinematographer and just assist life assistant. His name's Fraser Rigg, he's from London. I started working with him on Solo. Uh, he, uh, He, um, I see Shot Deck. Somebody just put Shot Deck. Yes, Shot Deck is big up to Larry Shore. Larry Shore created the best. Now he's he figured it out. <laughs> he figured it out. I was actually going to say Shot Deck next. He figured it out. Uh-huh. But um, yeah, then we take all those images that we like. He gathers them up. We organize them, and then we used to, we used to drop them in the keynote, right? 
which is still mm-hmm. works, right? Keynote still works because you can move them around, you can add things. Sometimes I add colors, strips of color to my. Um, maybe I can pull up a couple, but I'll add strips of color to my um, to my lookbook so that it's not just you know, it's it's. You can see that I'm cycling through ideas of color in my lookbook, and then from there I uh, um, I hand over a keynote presentation. And if it's not a key, keynote presentation, then now we're doing Shot Deck, and Shot Deck mm-hmm. is an incredible resource. And yeah. I found that Shot Deck's not, as you get deeper and de- deeper into Shot Deck, you start to realize that you're not even looking at the images like the images from film, because of the way you can search, things become so. Um, how should I say it? They become so um, slightly convoluted. You 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 start to see a a, a gridding. Mm. There's, there's an intelligence, a computer that's intelligently pulling these ideas. Yeah, right, yeah. For instance, you know, mm-hmm. and you, before you know, you have a you have a a, 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 um, a folder of many, many images that start to not even feel like film images. They just start to feel like images, which is so powerful because then you can see what cinematographer yeah. is actually doing in a in a still, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you know, a keynote like this is. Oops, sorry. See if I can. Here goes one. Mm-hmm. Sorry, y'all. You see my neighborhood. See the plant in the window. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you know, for uh-huh. Carrie Mae Weems, you know, Aaron Douglas. Uh, that's a family photo, family uh-huh. picture, you know, of my family. One of the early photographs I remember as a kid in my house of myself and my my loved ones. Uh huh. And these, you know. Uh, Chris Ophelia. Uh huh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is like this is and this is this is actually a lookbook that I made for a presentation that I did at my uh, at my son's school. But it just I was just trying to I was teaching people about my process. Wow. This is Ming Smith, one of the great photographers, Ming Smith. Uh huh. Yeah. Her image of the great Sun Ra. The frame from Haile Greenman's Bush Mama. Bush Mama, Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash, shot by Arthur Jaffa. Of course, the great Malik, Malik Saeed, and his, one of his mm-hmm. friends from Spike Lee's Clockers, mm-hmm. Belly. That's a that's a microscopic <laughs> image of a layer of silver halides on a strip of film. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to, to understand what it was. <laughs> yeah. And that's me trying to demonstrate that in the history of film, there probably been what? I wonder, I wonder if anybody's ever calculated, probably been over a billion trillion frames ever exposed. Mm-hmm. And every single frame has its own mosaic. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's impossible for the silver halide to ever mosaic the, the same. same. Yeah. Exactly. So every frame ever created in the history of image making is its own special, unique image. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, yeah, so I showed you that just to say that, you know, in a keynote, in a look, in a keynote or in a shot deck, you can create, you have a story. There's a story you're trying to tell and every frame has a, serves a purpose. So I use keynote and I use shot deck and, uh, um, yeah, that's kind of how, how, how it all goes down. And then, you know, you can revise, I revise throughout the process. If I'm inspired enough by the end, I can redo it and then I can hand that over to Joe, you know, and then mm-hmm. Joe can say, oh man, we, this is what we're doing now. Yeah, that's what we're doing, you know. And look at here, and here go some frames from the dailies, and I put that in there too. And I have some, you know, from the from the screen test, I put those in there sometimes, just as a as a living document. You know, I want it to be a living document, not just something that we look mm-hmm. at once and then we throw it away. It should continue to live. And you know, I have I have I have lookbooks that from my most violent year that I still look at and redo. You know, create a new version of it and take stuff out. You know, what it mm-hmm. could have been if it was di- if I had done it differently, I wouldn't have done that. I would have done something like something like this. You know, sure. I think as an artist, you gotta always be willing to make. You should make your practice a living thing. It should be alive. It should never be dead or dormant. You know, you can never. It's never too late to go back and revisit something that you did in a mm-hmm. in a, a, pre- a previous movie or a piece of previous piece of art artwork. You know. And, and what's interesting is that uh, these references that you show they're not obvious. Not something that you would you know take and and copy straight to a, a frame or something that you would shoot. It's something that you. 
you can interpret uh, in your own way yeah. and, and, and tell the story differently, but inspiring from that. So that, that's, that's what's it. great that's about it. making these types that's of That's it. References. It's a very much, very much an interpretive landscape. It's not, mm -hmm. never, carb never carbon copy. Those, those images to inspire, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when, when you shoot like different formats, like music videos, commercials, or or even documentaries, do you, is, do you have a different kind of process or it's just a, in a smaller scale? Yeah, commercials are, yeah, it's no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine. And it, yeah, it's a different, uh, it's a different discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're selling goods. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's a different thing, you know. And main, and you know, commercial things are usually worked out. Things are pretty rigid. Mm -hmm. commercials you know there's not a lot of room to depart from the creative that's already gone through several iterations before i see it so mm -hmm. you know but the th good thing about commercials is that you know you're there to bring your personality you're there to flex and play with toys and make it dark and you know work with colors and lights and things that you don't get a chance to usually work with on films you can work with them on commercials or try them out on a commercial or what have you you know and um you know mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I had somebody here say, are you, who's this? Michael Curatas? C-U-A-R-T-A-S? What's up, Mike? He asked me, am I selective with commercials? I try to be. <laughs> it's, less, it's, 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 less, it's less about the commercial, it's about the director, you know? Uh -huh. you know um, sure. Commercials, you know, you get to work with incredible directors, like, incredible <laughs> There's a lot of good directors in the commercial world, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's a good, it's a good place where you don't have all the stress, other, a lot of the stress that we have on films. You get to have a good time and hang out with folks and have good dinners and talk art and talk and and you know make make good frames, you know, and that's um, you get to work with you get to work with you know people who have a lot to say. It's really really special, you know. Sure, that sure. That's why I, I love. That's why I love. I don't. I don't have no. I have no problems doing commercials. You know, commercials mm -hmm. for me. As long as a good director, you know, I'm happy to do it. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man. all right. Hey, uh, <laughs> we're back. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, in your recent article to the American Cinematographer, um, you mentioned how important representativeness was to you in early in your career. So, um, how, how do you? What would you say? Representation? Would you say? Yeah, you, 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 you say a lot about how uh, having black filmmakers influenced oh, yeah. you and how important it was for you to be a filmmaker. So how do you think uh, with cinematography or as an artist, can we encourage the industry to be more diverse and, and open to people from different backgrounds? Hmm. Don't get me in trouble, man. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hmm. I'm, a, I'm gonna answer this in a way that I think is uh, most productive. I think that um, there's us, the filmmakers, mm -hmm. and, then there's, and then there's an industry. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's art, and then there's other spaces where we don't have to engage with an industry. There's independent cinema, there's an industry, there's all of these places where we can engage with uh, our craft, where we can use our craft in specific ways. And what, when I think about all the spaces where we go to, to manifest things through our art, the one place that seems to have the most amount, uh, the deepest pr problem or the most amount of issues in terms of accepting us for who we are and the stories that we want to tell is this big industry, this thing, right? This thing, this entity that was designed to take our, sellers, take our stories, sell our stories and make money, right? Mm -hmm. For better, for better, for worse. And my feeling is that they will never change. Mm -hmm. That industry, it is not part of their model. It is not uh, something they owe them. They feel like they owe themselves to change. Yes, they will um, 
continue to give some of us uh, folks of color, you know, uh, uh, us that exist in different communities, uh, you know, they will give us a moment to show up and tell our story, but they will never let us completely take it over. They would never let us completely have what we want from it because it's not designed that way. It was never designed that way. We have to remember, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to remember that the industry was designed to keep us out of the conversation. It was designed to uh, make fo- make movies about us, but not make movies for us, right? It was it was okay to make make us look like savages. It was okay to to make us look look like we had no humanity, but it would never be okay for us to uh, be part of that conversation to make films. It's not it's not part of their business. They have a business model. There is a there was a I'm, I I believe there's a business plan there somewhere written in a folder somewhere that that is very explicit about this, you know, and Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the, or that is the, that is the origin. Let's, you know, say for instance, specific, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot before, but specifically the American filmmaking canon starts with everybody's technical. Everybody considers, everybody considers most, most majority cultural filmmaking, most folks in the industry who don't know any better consider birth of a nation to be the technical canon of, um, represent have represent the 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 is the biggest technical achievement in film history um and so you know that automatically i'm automatically done with you when you when you have that perspective so i already know that Mm -hmm. i'm not welcoming your house because you're not speaking the same language as me you're not we don't have the same Mm -hmm. ideas Mm -hmm. and so um that so so for me i'm i'm less interested in trying to make these folks over here see me or try to understand who I am. What I'm more interested in is trying to get us to focus on what it is that we do every day, right? So you and I get up in the morning, we call our friends or we pick up these cameras and we go make little tiny films and we don't ask anybody's permission, right? We get a lot of fulfillment from that, right? We don't, we share tears together, we laugh together. We're not even interested in selling it. We're just interested in making and communicating, right? And in that in that scenario, when you go make your friends, when you go make when you go make f- films with your friends, your friends are trans, your films are your friends are straight, your friends are black, they're brown, they're poor, they're rich, they're atheist, they're Muslim, they're whatever. Mm-hmm. They represent the rank the because they're our friends and we and we living in the twenty first century and we know the how important for us it is for us to be in conversation with one another. So you already created an industry. You already created the industry that you want to have out there in the world. Mm-hmm. So my thing is, let's stop spending so much time trying to ask these folks over here mm-hmm. who don't have any capacity to understand how much you can bring to the story, how much your your vision, how much your language is important. Let's stop asking them to change their ways because all they do is window dress. They We complain about it and they put somebody in front of us that looks like us and they say, hey, look, we're addressing the issue because we have this, this brown person in front of you or this black person in front of you who's, who's saying everything that you want to hear. But then nothing changes, right? And that that's that little carrot they wave in front of our face and say, hey, we've done all the good work now. Can you just shut up? And I think that um, we have to stop asking them. Every day, every energy we spend asking them to change who they are is a wasted energy. It's, a, it's an energy that we could have been using to collectivize ourselves, to create community, to make community where we don't have to ask permission from anybody, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, we also have to, we also have to, I will say this too. There's also this thing that we have to, I want to say to young filmmakers is to be very, very cautious about, which is you're from, you're from Sao Paulo, you're from, you're from Lagos, you're from LA, you're from Peckham in London, you're from Baltimore, and you and your friends are making films together. Mm-hmm. And then that film, that little dirty film you made together for $10, nobody was there with you. You're all in the mud. You broke up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend during the making of the film. Your parents <laughs> kicked you out the house. You spent all your money on the film. Yes, Nicaragua. You spent all your money on the film. And somebody at the Sundance Film Festival sees your film. And they say, hey, bring that film to Sundance and show us the biggest independent film festival in the world. Everybody come, people come from all over the world to go there, including myself, right? I have to, I, you know, I have to give Sundance Film Festival a lot of props. They gave me a, a big launch. They gave me a, a big start. That's where I started this career that I'm having now started there. So if this, this part of my career started there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to make a life for myself as a cinematographer and I was able to do that through the festival. 
But then you you take your film to the festival and your festival wins, right? I mean, your 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 film wins at the festival. And the first thing people do is they start bidding for your film, right? It's not your grandmother or your aunt or people in the community that they pull together fifty thousand dollars to bid on the film, and then you go to ask to have the film bought, and then they buy the film. You know, they, now we now we have a very we have a you know we have some folks now they're in the conversation like Ava and who's got a Ray who does great. They do great work. They 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 have a consciousness around this idea, so they're very cautious about it. But a lot of folks who come to the table to bid on your film aren't very cautious because they're working within a culture that's not about keeping filmmakers together. It's about taking the director who made the film taking them away from their crew and the community that they made the film with, sending them off into Hollywood to make a film without their friends, the people that strengthen their vision, the people that help them make their vision. Mm -hmm. So for me, we have, we have, we, we have to also understand our own agency and, and fueling this animal, this animal that requires it, it be fed young blood, <laughs> young energy in order for it to survive. This beast that we call the industry, this beast we call Hollywood needs young, fresh blood in order for it to survive. And mm -hmm. the best way for them to, stay alive is to take the source of the energy, which is usually the director, away from the team, pull them away from the team, and separate them from the team, which means that you as a cinematographer, you as the costume designer, you as a sound person, then have to now go find the next director to fuel the conversation. And every time they pull us apart, we have to reconstitute ourselves. And when we reconstitute ourselves, we come to the table with trauma, right? And, and, you, and we, I think we have to stop thinking about it as a... Um, as a, uh, it's bigger than just, I'm not going to make another film or I'm not going to make a film with that director. We're talking about jobs, right? People's jobs were then taken away from them. And when you take jobs away from people, you destabilize communities, mm -hmm. right? Filmmaking, even though it's not Hollywood, filmmaking, even if you're making the film for $50, it's still an industry. It's still, people are still making mm -hmm. money, whether it be $1, whether it be $100 million, people are still making money. So when you pull the source of the story, when you pull the source of the energy, the source of the creativity out of the equation, then you dismantle a whole industry. And so I want us to be very much of how much how important it is for us to keep ourselves together. Mm -hmm. it, 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 is, it is the responsibility. And, you know, listen, when I was 10 years ago, when people would ask, I would say this and people would say, well, I, I need a job, but I, 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 would, I would have more sympathy. But now I don't have as much sympathy. I think, I think you made the decision. I'll say this to all directors. You made the decision to be the director. You are the general and the commander of the community. It is your job to keep us together. It is your job to not be pulled away from the folks that have helped you get this far. That's the responsibility you carry as the director. It's not my responsibility as the cinematographer. It's your responsibility as the director. We made this together. We must move forward together. <clears throat> and um, I think this, this, this takes the whole stress and the whole trauma and the whole strain we have these days about diversity. Please see me. Please give me a job. We don't need them. Mm -hmm. We don't need them. And honestly... On the other side of this corona crisis, that's going to be the new conversation anyway. That's mm -hmm. going to be the new conversation anyway because I mean, my, 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 my feeling is that on the other side of the equation, all the studios and all the filmmaking powers that be are going to say, okay, we need to make money now. So all those little small, tiny movies that we were making before, we're not making those anymore. We got to make all these new blockbusters so that we can make our money back. Mm -hmm. So it's us to us as independent filmmakers now to be stronger than ever. We've got to stick together now. This is... This is this is where we define. This is our defining moment where we 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 communicate to ourselves and our community in the world that we we are able to do this without uh, compromising our own humanity, compromising our own dignity, compromising our culture, compromising how we see ourselves. You know what I mean? And this and and it's on us. You know what I mean? Because they're very clear. They're very clear. They know there's a formula that works. And, you know, I can name, there's a whole list. I'm sure people here could even, what do they call this when they, they call comments? Okay, I'm sorry, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say thing. Twitter, tweeters. But these people who are making comments here, they can, you can name all the films that were filmmakers that made small independent films, and then before you know it, they were out making King Kong and all this other stuff, and they got crushed. They lost their voice. They lost the, their bite, you know what I mean? Because they found themselves in a system that, and found themselves on sets where they don't see their friends. They don't see themselves. You know what I mean? You know, the, the, I don't know if you guys remember. You should look it up online. Look at, look at, look at the Hollywood Reporter round, director's roundtable when 12 Years a Slave was uh, on. Mm -hmm. and Steve, Steve McQueen talking to all those directors that were there, the, the usual suspects, and him saying to them, like, how is it that you guys live in New York City? You live in Los Angeles, but I don't see no black or brown people in your films. 
-hmm. How is that you can say that you have you having a full human experience when I don't see diversity in your films? That's mm -hmm. insane. And so this is this is this is a uh, you know this is the uh, this is this is what we're up against. You know what I mean? And it's not about them. It's not about them. That's over. Mm -hmm. They're never they're never gonna do what we want them to do. So we have to do it for ourselves. Wow. And that 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 includes me. That includes me, somebody that is <clears throat> a, an agent, very much collaborate, uh, very much a collaborator in that space with them. Um, but you know, it comes at a price. You know, like you know, for instance, it's a whole different set of issues. But you know, that's the reason why you know we left Space Jam because we didn't feel like our needs were being met. This is the mm -hmm. reason why we left the movie because we we realized that it was all it was all co it was it was it was respectful, but our vision wasn't being honored. You know what I mean? We were very clear on the story, but they didn't want to honor the vision. Part of the reason why they didn't honor the vision because they didn't have a vision about who we are, what we are. We were trying to tell them we're making a film about a community that we know very well, and this is the way we feel it should be rendered on screen because we are of the community, and they were telling us that that's not, that's not the way it should be seen, and that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't get to bring me into the equation and tell me what to do. That's not how it works. So when you decide you're going to tell me what to do, then we have to leave. We have to go. We have to go mm -hmm. back to Baltimore and go make films, films with our friends because that's mm -hmm. where we're going to be respected. We're going to be respected. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, I think your audio is, uh, yeah. there's a problem with your audio again. Okay. Um, so, yeah. No, okay. no, it still sounds robotic for, for, some, for some reason. <laughs> maybe maybe it's the the battery of your of your microphone that's running out. I, I, I don't know. Is that better now? Um, Hello. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, much better. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that that this is just blew my mind. Everything that you said was incredible. It's no a, man. That's this is on us, bro. It's that's. It's the new reality too, man. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be the new reality for us. We have to recalibrate. We have to rethink. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to rethink how we're gonna um, how we're gonna you know do this. You know, mm -hmm. it's just gonna it's better for us, honestly. But this is this is the look. I got three kids. These are the things that you know you have to teach your children. It's like in order to get on the other side of this these things, your brother taking your toy or <laughs> or you know me telling you not to play with the fire uh -huh. right keep telling you not to play with the fire don't play with the fire and you know sometimes children and uh, the adults have to like get burned by the fire before they realize i can't play with the fire and so it's going to take you know some of us is going to have to get burned but just don't stick your hand in the fire again <laughs> it's going it's, it's going to be a little painful so we're going to eat beans and rice listen it's already in our culture so we're going to be okay eating beans and rice anyway <laughs> we're gonna be okay. Even be, we're gonna be fine. We're not, you know, we're not gonna lose out. We're never gonna. And if you and if you're doing it with community, if you're making these decisions as a as a community, your children are never gonna go hungry anyway. Mm -hmm. You're never gonna pay the price for the decision you made, like my ancestors did. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They paid the price. Every they had everything taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And you know, when when they decide when they made certain decisions, they had things taken away from them. And they, and the space in which I live still has the capacity to treat black and brown people the same way. And I know that they will. But when you, when you strengthen yourself as a community, and people, we know that certain people in the community, we have to create barriers around so they can never put their hands on them, they can never take away from them. That's part of our duty. That's part of our job is, is people who love sure. one another, not just the people in your house, but the people in your community who you care about. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and speaking about um, like um, this, this, powerful stories and uh you shot like uh very relevant films important films uh in the subject like selma and also the when they see us a very powerful and complex and and with a great emotional weight story so uh to you uh what it means to tell these types of stories and how do you communicate the the emotions that you feel about that story to images Right. Um, well, I think I think I think this goes back to <clears throat> it's all it's, for me. It's all about story. It's all about story. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not about making shots. It's about telling stories, right? Like, so um, even before I even start thinking about shots or lighting or texture or color, I, I have to actually read the script and I have to feel like 
I see myself in the story. Mm -hmm. And um, if I see myself in the story, then I know that my contribution to the story will come is coming from the right place. Right. I know that I essentially know that everything that I'm giving to the story is coming from um, the spirit of the story. And so <clears throat> the takeaway for me then is that I'm telling a story that I know, you know, I know, like I have a relationship with. It's not something that I'm exploring. It's not, it's not anthropology for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not mm -hmm. interested in like studying people's shoes and studying their elbows and their ears. Like that doesn't interest me. I'm interested in telling stories that I know, you know, I'm interested in seeing people that I know on the screen and, I, and it's an honor and a privilege to photograph stories that I know. And it's an honor and a privilege to photograph people who are rendered, people who are um, renderings of folk, people that I know. And so something like Selma, I wasn't at Selma, but it's a story that's in my DNA. You know, my uncle was at Selma. My uncle mm -hmm. marched in Selma. You know what I mean? My grandparents made a contribution to Selma. My, my family was in the movement. My parents were deeply involved, you know, um, they pay, you know, many people in my family paid the price, you know, and so I had to tell that story because I know that story and it didn't take mm -hmm. much for me to see myself in that story because mm -hmm. that's a story I've had a relationship with since I was a kid. It's part of my mythology. It's part of who I, it's part of my, uh, my epigenetics. It's part of who I am, part of how I see myself, part of how I see my children, the community I live in, the people I love has been filtered through those experiences, you know. Um, <clears throat> you take something like uh, um, Mother of George, you know, like, that's my story. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm at, I'm of African descent. I come from Africans. My people are African, um, but I'm not, I'm not, in, but I'm not a first, I'm not a Nigerian immigrant living in New York, but I am, but I am an outsider. I am a black person. I am a black person who considers themselves an African living in New York. And so <clears throat> I see myself in that story. I'm a person who wrestles with tradition because even though this isn't, <clears throat> this isn't the birthplace of, of, you know, my, my, my ancestral connection is in Africa. You know, my people, um, you know, I still have tradition here. You know what I mean? There are a lot of traditions that my people have created, black people have created in this country that, that as, as we do with all traditions, we wrestle with, we have to understand, we have to understand the complexities of it. We have to understand how we can move forward, change things, but also retain and respect the culture that our ancestors have created. And so I see myself in that story, you know. Um, you take something like uh, um, a most violent year, you know. It, I know it seems very distant, but you know the thing that touched me about that story was about <clears throat> was about New York as an animal, New York as this thing, you know, that just seems so despairs no one, you know, mm -hmm. and that when you try to do right in New York, <laughs> the wrong thing always gets you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't selling oil or I didn't have that. I, didn't, I wasn't wearing beautiful brown mohair coats. That wasn't my story. But it was mm -hmm. my story because I directly identified with the way uh, those characters, their relationship they had with New York. I was living in New York at the time and it felt like it was swallowing mm -hmm. me up, you know. So I saw myself in the story. Um, I can go through every film and tell you uh, why I took the film because I see myself in there. And so when, and when I know, once I see myself in the story, then I know I'm telling my story and I know, I, I know what I'm talking about. I know I have something to say. Um, then it's, a, then it doesn't make it easier for me to tell the story. It just means that I know I'm in the right place and I'm working on the right movie. Mm -hmm. So, so how exactly uh, in, in a film like Arrival or Solo, how did you see yourself in the story? Well, <laughs> you know, so, so solo is it is what it is. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 sort of uh, nomad. You know, the 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 person that <laughs> the, it's about the person who feels confident in everything one has, but nobody believes in it, and you have to show them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's about the dream of showing them and winning at the end. You know what I mean? It's about that. It's that whole pathology we create about the thing that we have that <laughs> we, we feel is special that everybody should experience, but nobody believes they should experience it. Mm -hmm. It's also about the dream of being, you know, I've been with my wife for 20 years. It's a dream about being young lovers on the run, you know, outlaws. 
uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fighting for what you think is right, you know what I mean? Being chased uh-huh. by the, the establishment, you know what I mean? Searching for that one thing to spark a revolution. Like, it's uh-huh. all in there, you know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, you know, um, you know, something like uh, Ain't Them Body Saints is, is uh, you know, I really love there's a there's a there's a there's a sex there's a period of American history that I really love and it falls it, it kind of falls in between like 1900 and like 1945 you know and America was America was going through great change great change and it had to change its identity many times you know um, and it, also at the same time you know um, there was there was in spite of in spite of its its own sick demented racist history. There was a moment where it felt deeply egalitarian, and that's during the Great Depression. And mm-hmm. many radical, radical folks of all race and creeds came out of that time. You know, this is where you find the Abraham Lincoln brigades come out of that time. This is where you have, you know, folks like Odetta, Woody Guthrie, all of the Paul Robeson, all of our great protest musicians, singers, activists came out of this moment. You know what I mean? This is where you have. Mm-hmm the McCarthy era. This is where you have the rise of communism in America and, and the and, and the a sense of socialism. And this is where you have the rise of serious, interesting political left wing movements in America that really inspire me as 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 a humanist, you know? Mm-hmm. And I always wondered who are the grandchildren of all of those progressive white people that came out of those movements? You know? They nice. were there, you know, you know, where where are the where's the great great grandchild of uh of uh of uh, John Brown, you know, what are they doing right now? Or, you know, uh, um, you know, all all of the all of the very interesting people that came came out of that moment. Who are they? Where are the grandkids? And when I read that script, I felt like this is what they would be doing. All the kids who were the grandkids of those folks of those moments who were mm-hmm. deeply political and deeply interesting, their grandkids would be about the heist. <laughs> they would be about getting the money to do something revolutionary with it. And when I read that script, I felt like that was it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you, and you, and you had these characters that, um, there was an underworld. There was a world that was being, uh, you know, deeply inspired by, you know, a, po- a, a politic or an idea about community and self that wasn't really expressed in the film openly, but it's, it was about these little isolated communities of people that had no fear of the law. You know what I mean? Had no fear of the state. They just needed to make sure they could, get the bread and do what they needed to do and that's really inspiring and it's part of my part of, I feel like it's part of my story I feel like and I've had people in my family that have done the same something like Arrival is um, <clears throat> hey listen it's about when you have kids man it's always game over it's like, <laughs> you know it's no longer about am I gonna die am I gonna wake up tomorrow it's about the mortality of your children and how does that mm-hmm. affect how you see how you play with time, how you interact with time. You know, time isn't the same anymore once you start having kids. You know, it's a very different notion. It's more than a notion, you know? And um, so for me, I just, I, I got it. You know what I mean? Like, Louise, it's crazy. It's, I made so many films. Literally, the only f- film character I remember, <laughs> name I remember from most, all the films I made, Louise, I, she never, the name never leaves me because, you know, uh-huh. And it is about it is it is about a melancholy. I'm not an I don't consider myself an intellectual, but a melancholy intellectual who's mourning something, mm-hmm. and and one day aliens show up. You know that's <laughs> that's what that movie's about. But mm-hmm. you know that's isn't that the dream in the middle of this COVID thing, in the middle of you know systematic repression of your people, police brutality against your people, you know mass incarceration a deep history of slavery, a deep history of economic inequality. I wish I would just look out my window on a cloudy day like it is here and there'd be a spaceship here that would just take us out of here. You know Mm -hmm. (laughs) what I mean? You know, that's kind of, that's what, that's what that film felt like to me. You know, it's just, if you, you want it to happen, but you never imagined what happened and one day they land and then they, they enlighten you, they show you something, you know, Mm -hmm. because those days where you feel hopeless, like humanity can't answer or fulfill its own destiny, whether it be through God, whether it be through whatever you believe in, you do you, you you need that intervention from above to come and take the weight off your shoulders. And so it may not be an alien, it could be something else, but that the spirit of that is in that film and that's why that's why I did it.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you try to have a, like a, every film that you that you go on board. You try to have an emotional connection with with each every single one of them. I have and to. Uh, I have to. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I have to. You know, if not, then. But is it something that you think it grows uh, during the process of the film, or do do you instantly fall in love with the script or? Or whatever you have a, a specific sensation mm. that you, when you read the script, or, or is it something that you develop throughout the process? Yeah, scripts are scripts are usually man. <laughs> scripts aren't usually that good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not like you know, it's not like reading. You know, a great piece of literature. You know what I mean? It it can be. I've read. I've read a couple. Mm -hmm. You know, I've read a couple of scripts that are just like am mind blowing. You know what I mean? So so mind blowing that you just feel like they should even be made into a film because you just know a film is not going to do it sir any service. It's going things are going to happen and it's never going to be that thing. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's it's not completely about the words on the page. It's also about the director. It's also about mm -hmm. the art the artist that I'm collaborating with. Mm -hmm. And um, I give things. I always give things benefit of the doubt. You know, it's like it's not always there on. It's not all all there on the page. But I know I studied Denis Villeneuve's work, so I know what's, what's what he's capable of. You know what he mm -hmm. will do. And so I'm happy to ignore the things in the script that didn't work for me because I knew that he was going to, uh, you know, uh, make it make it make it better you know i mean the the one person that yeah i mean the one person that is just an insane incredible writer i mean incredible is ava ava's ava's scripts are crisp mm -hmm. <laughs> they 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 read well you know what i mean mm -hmm. you know and uh you know we just you know Unfortunately, you know, when you're behind the camera, you don't get to get inside sometimes and really see how folks are moving stuff around. But, you know, if you take one of our scripts and you go make that script, it's, if you can make that script, you, you're in good shape. You know, I mean, it's pretty. They read well. You don't put them down. You know, you want to know what's happening next. But then there's some scripts that are just conceptual, you know, mm -hmm. too conceptual. But that doesn't matter to me because if the director behind it is doing interesting things, then I'm happy to say I got enough from that, I got a feeling from that or I got enough out of it that now nah, it's fine I just want to now hear your thoughts on it, let's see where, where you're trying to head, you know, what you want to do with it mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a so, so that's uh, the process is now nice, that's cool uh, and, and the directors that you work uh, do they give you the, the creative freedom to also you know, give your input to the story, are they open to, to your yeah. ideas yeah yeah it's never it's not yeah it's always a battle the battle is how much you want to give mm -hmm. it's never about being asked to give because mm -hmm. the directors that i work with these days want want you involved they want maximum involvement and so it's about feeling secure or safe enough to let down your guard you know mm -hmm. directors have a real they have a real uh you know, sometimes I think about it like, oh, maybe I'll direct a film. And then I say, nah, <laughs> I'm not a director because uh -huh. it requires a lot of uh, <clears throat> getting people to trust. Uh -huh. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And it's a lot of work that doesn't necessarily equal frames in the film. Uh -huh. And um, I've had the, I'm, the honor and privilege of working with some incredible directors, like some of the best of our time, you know, mm -hmm. and a few of them are going to be the best ever, you know, ever mm -hmm. to make, make films. And, uh, I see what they have to put up with. I see what they have to do with, deal with. And, uh, it's a lot of getting people to trust the process and, and, and let alone you have to get your DP to open up. You know, and that and that 
and I'm not, and I'm not, um, <clears throat> I'm not exempt. You know, I'm not. I can't be the cog in the wheel for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't definitely be. Uh, sometimes, like any human being, your emotions get in the way, and you have to be coached back to a logical place. And so, um, yeah, it's just really about trust. You know, it's really mm-hmm. about and uh, getting me to open up and mm-hmm. feel like my ideas would be supported when I share them. That's a big, you know, it's, that's, that's, you know, it's what we're all, it's like, it's like kids and parents and partnership and all of that. It's, it's that same normal thing of just, you have a feeling and you don't want it. You don't want the feeling to be discredited. You don't want it to be thrown away. You want it, you want it to have this, you want it, you want it to live. You want it to have this, it's, it's try, you know? And so you, you worry that if you throw it out there, somebody's going to crumble or throw it in the garbage. So Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of courage to go to the person sometimes and say, I got this idea and don't knock it. I'm just going to, I got to do it, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that, that's, that's the, 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 the collaboration part for, for me, I think full responsibility falls on me because genu- gen- generally the directors I work with genuinely want a lot of direct engagement. You know, they really are very collaborative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, do you believe having like a, a consistent style between your films is important uh, as an artist? And like, if someone sees one of your films, they are able to tell it's a Brad for Young. Do you think that's important? It's relevant? No, no, no. Actually, I don't even want people to see the cinematography anymore. You know what I mean? I want my cinematography to be invisible. Invisible. Mm-hmm. You know, I want. I don't. You know. Yeah. that's the other cautionary tale you know it's like <clears throat> you know I had, we all we all do as you grow you have that moment where you want people to see what you're doing you want people to see you and so you want them to see your work so you go so hard but you gotta be we gotta be invisible man you know you mm-hmm. can't take over the story you gotta be you gotta be a, it's collaboration that's key remember it's a collaborative art form mm-hmm. um, you know if you see if you see uh, if you see a more or you see, uh, you know, uh, what, what was that? Um, there are many Darius Kanji films that you would not know Darius shot. Mm-hmm. You know, I and mean, they're masterful. You know, they might not be the Darius Kanji that you want to see, but the person that shot Amour can't be the same person that shot Seven and Uncut Gems. That's, that's mm-hmm. a that's a different, <laughs> that, that's not the same person, you know, but it uh-huh. is, it is, mm-hmm. you know, it is. And that, that I admire that. I admire that. I admire that. And the thing about it is every one of those films and even the stuff he does with Woody Allen, every one of those films, you know, that the person that's behind the camera knows what they're doing and they have something to say. Um, you know, so it's never a question of intentionality or technical acumen or artistic acumen. It's never that. And that's 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 the thing that I feel is more important to bring to the table is that when people see the image, they feel something, whether it be a filmmaker being being able to articulate all the technical things they love or my aunt not being not knowing any of that, but only being able to communicate what they felt. That's the job of the cinematographer. It's not the job of the cinematographer to uh in my opinion, you know. Mm-hmm. But then you, but then you know, you have, you have, you have the, we have the masters like, like, like Roger. You know, you very, I'm, I'm very much in tune to his work. I see him, I see him in the work. And if you want to have that kind of relationship with the process, uh, more power to you. You know, like I, re, you know, and I think that's the reason why we love Roger is because we, we are guaranteed a, a particular qualitative analysis that is like no one else like there's <laughs> my friend my friend my friend Maceo Bishop who's an incredible steady cam used to be an incredible steady cam operator is now an incredible DP fast shooting up like a missile <sighs> this guy's incredible he said and he's, he he operate for all, operated for all of them Harris Savides Roger mm-hmm. Deakins Darius Kanji Philippe Lesur all of these cats they all work with Maceo you know and uh, he said, Roger Deakins is like, cinematographers are like cabinet makers. <laughs> Everybody makes their own cabinet with their own hardware, you know? <laughs> it just happens to be that Roger just makes the best cabinets. 
we all make cabinets and people buy our cabinets for for whatever they are, you know what I mean? For whatever we bring to the table. But Roger Deakins makes the best cabinets. <laughs> but uh -huh. when you get a Roger Deakins cabinet, it's not going to have a different piece of hardware. It's going to be the same hardware every time. Mm -hmm. But it's a masterful cabinet. And that's why mm -hmm. you call him. That's why you ask him to come do your film. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But uh, also, I think uh, style has a, uh, a great relation with the scripts and, and the films that you decide to shoot. So uh, do you think if you always choose the same types of story to shoot and your, your style has something to do with those scripts, it, do you believe it's okay to, to always kind of do the same language for a film? I think if so. it works. <clears throat> I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine. You know, if we were in the, if we were in the fine art world, nobody would even question it. Nobody would even say, you know, why is it that you made that sculpture ten times over again? Mm -hmm. Nobody would say it. We would all come to the gallery and see the sculpture for what it is, even if it was the same same sculpture same sculpture made ten times over. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee I guarantee you the wrinkle in the finger, if a person made a hand, it could be the same form of the hand ten times over, but the little nuances and the wrinkles of the finger are never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where that's where the identity is. Some of us, the identity is how we make the hand every time. Arthritic hands, straight hands, dignified hands, whatever it may be, you know. And uh, But some of us make the same hand. But it's just about how we carve out all the imperfections and all the things in the hand. Is That's something that is easily overlooked. But I'm telling you, if you dig into, like, for instance, again, Roger, you look into all his work, you're going to see every film has its own rendering of the textured value of the hand. But he makes mm -hmm. that same hand, and when he makes it, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. hand. But there's there's etchings in there that may not be decipherable, but it's there. Mm -hmm. you know, don't ever don't ever think that it's not there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is yeah. This is this is a wise person with intentionality as his weapon. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. why he's and 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 think about this about somebody like Roger. I'm trying to like make it less about my process. I want to really celebrate somebody that I think it embodies this thing about doing the same thing over and over again, whatever that mm -hmm. means, however we conceptualize that. I don't see that. I see it. I call it building a body of work or the cumulative value of your work. Mm -hmm. um, just just take this for what it's worth. The reason why we know Roger is the greatest of our time is one of the greatest of our time is because he makes us feel something. It's not about the way it looks. Because mm -hmm. we, 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 already, we already had that clocked in our head because that's why we go see. We go see the films for Roger before we go see the films for the director. Mm -hmm. it's, what he, it's how he makes us feel. He makes us proud. He makes us feel like those images are just robust. They make us feel like we're actually there. They feel present. They feel crystallized. You know, for instance, you know, a lot of people ask, why is he such sharp lenses and such da 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 da? It's because he that for him makes it more immersive. That makes it more three dimensional. That makes it more. It's all these other things that are getting in the way before you get to the human story aren't there. It's just clarity, straight mm -hmm. to the eye of the straight to the eye of the actor, straight to the action. And that's like I said, that. There's some stuff working underneath <laughs> that's bigger than the image. You know what I'm saying? There's some stuff working underneath that's massively takes all the years that he's photographed images and all the mistakes he's made. And you can see it. You can you go back and watch Roger's early films and watch where he look at his trajectory. So we say it's the same thing every time, but that's also impossible because every film is different. Every film is different in the sense of his growth. And he's still he's an older man and he's still growing every film. Mm -hmm. And and his curve is like this too. Some stronger than others, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but he's an artist, and that's the body. That's his, his body of work. If it's I consistently, a, consistency. He's, and... His he, he listen. He's consistently playing. He's consistently inspired. Mm -hmm. Like that too, is important. He's consistently inspired to be at this point in his career and still be inspired to make those images is mm -hmm. amazing. Hey, I'm 42. I may not make it past 50. <laughs> at, 50, I'm, at 50, I might retire. You know what I mean? If mm -hmm. all the inspiration is drained, then uh, then uh, I'm not gonna show up. I'm gonna I'm gonna go be a farmer. You know, or I'm gonna 
build a school for, for my kids. But mm-hmm. Roger Deakins is still getting inspired and still inspiring us. So bless him. Mm-hmm. And, and bless his consistency and bless that thing he does that we believe in and we value and we appreciate and and uh, we know we're going to get every time, you know? Mm-hmm. All right. This this is great. <laughs> this, is, has, this has been very inspiring. I think we are we're coming close to the second limitation, but uh, uh, I'd like to, to thank you for sharing all this amazing information and all your uh, your brilliant cinematographer, one of the uh, no, cinematographers that I admire the most, uh, really. So I really hope you you also maintain yourself consistently inspired and I hope that you, you go way beyond your 50 years old if you want to. <laughs> Because I'd like to to continue to see your amazing work, you know. Hey, Jomo Frey, I see Jomo. I saw a friend come up on there. Hey, Jomo. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So I was right. I was just looking at all these names. It's incredible. <laughs> Kira Kelly. Hey, hey, it's people I know in here. <laughs> cool. Nah, it's so, my yeah. pleasure, man. Nah, it's my pleasure. Yeah, any any time, bro. Any time. Yeah. This has been great. So thanks everyone who yeah. joined this live stream too. So this has been great. Thank you very much, Brad. You're welcome. Take care, man. Thank Peace. you.